Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Growing Up Loving Henry panel discussion. This is our second program in our Yom HaShoah Holocaust Remembrance Day series, honoring the Holocaust survivor and philanthropist Henry Landsworth's life and legacy. I'm Barbara Goldstein, Executive Director of the Holocaust Education Resource Council. On behalf of myself and Stacy Goldring, President of Searching for Identity, we are pleased to bring this discussion today. We hope you had an opportunity to learn about Henry Landworth's remarkable life. It defies a, sum a brief summary and deserves the beautiful film, Loving Henry. A survivor of five concentration camps, this man lost his entire family to the murderous hands of the Nazis. After the war, miraculously, he reunited with his twin sister, Margot. Starting life again in the US, Henry became an incredibly successful hotelier. His friendships extend across the world, including the friendship of NASA's Mercury 7 crew. And, while, and all the while, he emerged as an amazing humanitarian and philanthropist. Today, critically ill children's dreams come true at Henry's Give Kids the World, highlighted in the film. His philanthropy is endless. Stacy and I extend our gratitude to director Robert Allen Black for creating Loving Henry. We also thank Landa Landworth, Tallahassee Community College, Hadassah, Helen Hill, Lisa Paycheck, and Chase Van Tilburg. And we thank you because of your gifts of membership to HERC and Searching for Identity make these endeavors possible. As the daughter of Holocaust survivors, loving Henry affects me in a, in, in a deep way. Henry, like my dad, Marcel Spiegler, had it to pick up the pieces of his Nazi ravaged life and begin again as part of the American immigrant experience. I would like to turn the program now to Stacy to introduce our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Today, with his three children, we'll explore what it was like growing up, loving a father named Henry Lanworth. I'm pleased to share with you a painfully condensed summary due to time of the incredible philanthropic lives of Greg Landworth, Lisa Ullman, and Gary Landworth, focusing on family first. Lisa, Greg, and Gary have served leadership roles in their family foundation, named in memory of murdered Holocaust victim, Fanny Landworth, the grandmother, Lisa, Greg, and Gary never knew. Greg led the Fannie Landworth Foundation as president for 10 years, Lisa and, Gary, Lisa and Gary serving on the board. More than $10 million was contributed to prevent homelessness and hunger, support youth education, senior services, and student mentorship. Art with the Heart in Healthcare, a nonprofit Lisa co-founded, offers patients and family art experiences, enhancing the healing process at Wolfson's Children's Hospital, Nemours and Mayo Clinics. For the last six years, she has participated in the Searching for Identity second generation writing workshops, and she also serves on its board of directors. Lisa speaks in schools about her family's harrowing experiences, and not only a gifted writer and interior designer, Lisa is an artist, expressing her identity through canvas on mixed media. Gary founded and served as president of A Gift for Teaching and A Gift for Music, organizations generating millions of dollars in free educational and musical resources for students in need throughout Central Florida. He's worked in executive capacities at Give Kids the World Village, an 89-acre nonprofit resort in Kissimmee, Florida, providing 
cost-free wish vacations to critically ill children and their families who want to go to a magical place, experience the pure joys of childhood and capture precious family memories missed due to illness. Since 1986, Give Kids the World has welcomed more than 176,000 families from every state in the union and across 76 countries on our planet. Gary continues his intense nonprofit work serving on numerous boards in leadership and consultation capacities. All children of survivors inherit a decision. Unlike most of us, these second gen are forced to make a choice to share or not share their parents' Holocaust story. Woven into this decision is this confluence of their own personal identity, the historic relevance of their parents' survival, today's horrific rise in Jewish hatred crimes, Holocaust distortion and denial. The second gen identity is complicated because, well, to riff on Tolstoy, families are complicated. The lasting effects of the Holocaust did not end when the concentration camps were liberated. So a very welcome special today to all the second and third gen. And for those of you who are with us, because well, this sounded interesting, we hope when this program comes to an end, you will be inspired to act on Henry's message of love and kindness. Have you ever imagined what it was like to grow up with parents who survived the Holocaust as the creator of the Second Gen Workshops, this is our focus, as it will be here today with Gary, Greg, and Lisa. And as they come on board, if you have any questions, please type those into the Q&A. Lisa, Greg, and Gary, let's get started. Welcome. Thank you, Lucy. Hi, Lisa. Hey, Gary. Hi, Stacey. Hello. So we'll just wait for Greg to pop on, and then we'll get started. Well, while we wait for Greg to get on, um, I, I want to kind of um, uh, ask the first question about the film. And that would be, um, what did it feel like uh, to watch your father's film? Uh, in the past few days, many who are with us today have had the experience of seeing the beautiful film that Robert Allen Black directed, uh, Loving Henry. And so I'm just curious, what was it like to watch your father on film? Um, Lisa, would you mind taking that first? Sure. Thanks, Stacy. I'm so grateful to be here today and talk with you about um, the film, my dad, and, and kind of what um, we've all gone through as, as children um, of, of um, Henry Lamworth. Um, I watched the film yesterday, and it was especially emotional for me um, because we're coming up on our dad's uh, third year anniversary of his, of his passing, and it's uh, actually Friday. April 16th. So, you know, watching him and seeing um, him speak and um, just his, his, just walking, his, his gait, his smile, his interaction with the kids that give kids the world, it, um, you know, it, it made me miss him so much more. So, um, you know, it was kind of, it was hard. Um, but at the same time, my dad was very private and to think of him in this kind of public figure is mm -hmm. um, strange because we just saw him as our pop and to think of him as anything but that it's, it's, it's surreal. So um, you call them pop. 
Yeah, we called him Pop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, that's how it felt yesterday. And that's how, you know, but I, I've seen it many times and there's always different feelings every time I see it. So that's what I experienced yesterday. Okay, Gary? Um, I watched it yesterday as well. And I felt the same thing, Lisa, that you did. I, I felt like I missed him more. I watched the way yeah. he walked down the roads and I watched the way he uh, walked with the kids and, and how inspired or how energized he was around the kids. But um, when I first saw it, the first time we saw it in that little uh, screening room, I walked in as someone that was really excited to, to hear a story that we hadn't heard before because although our dad had talked about the Holocaust in general terms, um, and we had read the books that he and uh, his friend Bill Hal Medeiros had written. We we never really got the we never really got it from him. And so I went in there wanting to see this story that I didn't know what was going to be. I didn't know what was going to be on there. I didn't know what he was going to say. Um, he had opened up so much to Robert Black, the director, um, in ways that we had no idea. And so I was watching it as somebody that wasn't his son. I was watching it as just somebody that didn't know him. And I was amazed at what I was seeing on the screen. I was also right next to him and I was worried about what he was going to react to. I didn't know uh, how he would feel seeing what he had seen on the screen. Mm -hmm. Did he comment on that after, after you screened it the first time? He was pretty tough. Um, I think, uh, I mean, as, just for him to even have gone through the process of going there, he's, he was uh, ultimately courageous. And I think he, he viewed uh, watching the movie and talking about it afterwards as something that he just had a strength of, of being able to do once he started doing it. I mean, he never wanted to when, he was, when we were kids, um, but I think as he allowed us in, then he became more comfortable with it, I think. Well, that, that brings up another question then. Why, you know, it's not easy to decide to make a film. Uh, why did he decide to do it? And what was that like? Did he like call you up on the phone and say, uh, hi guys, um, I'm gonna make a film? Mm -hmm. Or like, how does that happen? Mm -hmm. He was asked to do the film. He didn't really have anything to do with it besides being asked by, um, David Haskell, who was the producer, and he had heard about our dad's story and had read about it through a friend of a friend. Or, and so he really was just asked to do this film. He didn't, he had never really thought about doing a film. And, and when we were, when we first heard that he was getting followed around by this group of filmmakers that we, I didn't know from anybody. I just always saw them, they were at parties, they were everywhere, and I just sort of let them be. Uh, I didn't really start paying attention until my dad started saying, well, they want me to go back to Poland, they want me to go to Auschwitz, and then my ears picked up, and, and I said, um, is that such a good idea? Do we really think that should happen? Um, is that gonna be good for you? And I'll never forget, we were sitting in a restaurant on a Sunday afternoon having lunch, and he said, well, I decided I'm going back to Poland with the film crew. And I said, when? And he said, I'm leaving Thursday. Wow. And so Lisa and I and my brother, Greg, who didn't have a passport, so he couldn't go, but we had to drop everything because we couldn't not be there and we couldn't not be part of that. So um, he always saw... <laughs> Film is sort of the secondary thing. Never really paid that much attention to it. Okay, so I have some questions. First of all, how old was he uh, when he decided to go to, to pursue this? And I didn't realize uh, watching the film, and this is why you know, I've seen that I saw the film a few years ago, and you know, it stays with you. Um, I didn't realize that like the film then was, it was evolving in real time as Henry was going through this process uh, because it wasn't decided at the beginning, okay, we're gonna shoot here, here and here in America and then we're gonna go here, here and here in Europe. It just kind of, yeah, that's, that's storytelling. You just don't know mm -hmm. where it's gonna go. So how, do you remember how old your dad was when he decided to do this? And 
2001, yeah, go ahead. so he was born in 27, so uh, 73, 74. Okay. And did you feel protect, like a certain protection? Like, were you worried about him? Mm -hmm. And was this one of his, his, one of his ideas? Because I know he was an ideas man. Did you, did you worry? I mean, this is not, you have to be brave. In 73, like, I, talk about that. I was that. petrified. I was petrified. You're petrified. There. And I went there. Um, my main goal for going there wasn't to be in the movie. I didn't want to be in it really. I wanted to protect him from the film crew so that they wouldn't take advantage of him and they wouldn't put him in situations that would just make for a better movie. Now, after I've gotten to know Robert and the film crew, they never would have done that. And mm -hmm. I didn't really ever have to step in, but um, that was my main goal for going and dropping everything at the time. Okay. Okay. That's, I think it would have also been helpful in retrospect to have had some kind of therapist with, um, you know, my dad mm -hmm. and, and to debrief, to talk through a lot of things. I know, you know, Linda was his, you know, confidant and everything else there. And I think she really held his hand literally through the whole thing. But I, I think that that would have um, helped the stress level and helped him process what he was actually having to witness again and, you know, live through again. So. And yeah. the one thing that was so surprising to me were on the, the bus rides and the train rides to different right. places, he and Margo, his sister and his cousin Kitty would start talking about things. Um, and I, I, we would be listening and I said, have you never talked about this? It's been 50 five years nope never they never once would have got, mm -hmm. got together and talked about their experiences in the camps until that until those couple days wow that's that's it's almost like you're you know learning who your father was all over again because then whatever you're hearing you have to go ahead and reshuffle that into your life and you know your experiences with your dad growing up and to never talk about something so incredibly huge, the worst thing that has ever happened to mankind in recorded history, and you're just hearing about, that's, um, it, wow. Um, uh, your father mentions that the film um, could offer some catharsis. Did it, did it partially, did it not? Did, what was the takeaway once that experience was, at, after he went to Poland, came home, was he a changed man? Things went back to normal. Like, what happened after that? Well, as you, if you've seen, if you did watch the movie, I know maybe some people that are on the call may not have had the opportunity or, you know, time to watch it. But, um, you know, he ended up um, a few days later when he and Linda were going on a, a, a trip to, to Italy he had a stroke and it was just too much for him. I mean, the stress of what happened, all the filming, every place that he, he stepped and walked. And so from there, I mean, he lost his vision partly. He, he was very frightened. I mean, it was a really difficult time. Um, and, you know, afterwards he ended up, you know, going to Hawaii. He, he ended up just having this, once he recovered and recuperated, kind of ended up having this new lease on life again. It was almost as though he was kind of like reborn. It was, you know, um, and uh, I don't know. I think it, it, it didn't have as much to do with, I think the trip as it did his, um, his illness, so. I think what I saw was that it brought up everything that he had been trying to pushed down as far as he could for 55 years it brought it all back up and mm. I didn't see it as a good thing. Okay. Um, Greg, um, how did your father, how did you see your father after the trip um, adding to what Lisa has explained the stroke etc a new Lisa on life was his relation any different with you with the siblings? Uh, I think 
Probably he, he seemed a lot more frail and he did seem scared. Uh, he couldn't see well and he was weak. So it's difficult to see him like that when he's been so strong all of his life and uh, hasn't let things bother him. Um, but he recovered and, you know, in hindsight, it probably wasn't the best thing for him to do to go and have that trip. Mm -hmm. I can say one more thing. For, Please. For, for me as uh, the son and, and Greg and Lisa probably the same, it was the best thing he could have ever given to me in terms of understanding his background. I am so grateful that he, I, I'm sorry that he did it, but I'm grateful after the fact that he did and that Robert was able to put together such a beautiful movie because we have this thing that's really his legacy and we can watch it over and over and we can watch the way he he talks and he walks and and actually have something that's a, a personal story about a holocaust not just saying there were six million people murdered here's a story of one and his sister two and his cousin kitty three people that had these very specific experiences and so the specific stories that they told in the movie and they told after the movie and during the movie that weren't that didn't get in I, I think that's what makes the talking about the holocaust so much more impactful it, it's the personal stories it's not the the data or the numbers and and that's a, a, to, a huge gift to us to have that story from him you know it's um it's so difficult to ask ask a survivor, and I would argue a second gen, to talk about the pain and to go to those uh, difficult places and not only, okay, let's talk about it, but let's write about it. Let's get it on film. Uh, you know, as a storyteller, I almost feel like I must tread so carefully because I do not want to be a voyeur. But um, in the back of my head, I just hear uh, the denial and the distortion and, um, you know, we're, we're on borrowed time. So the idea that it took a toll on your father, there's no doubt the, his age and the emotional toll could very well exacerbated everything that happened to him. Uh, but it is, Gary, such, it's such a gift to history and humanity uh, that uh, he, he did that. And of course, uh, you get all the effects of that as, as, as the children, um, and you don't get a choice. Uh, there, there it is, right? Uh, we have so many questions coming in, so I, I want to make sure I get to those uh, regarding the film before uh, we move forward. Uh, uh, I wouldn't, um, it wouldn't be fair if we did not uh, discuss Margot such an incredible component, uh, you know, uh, part of the fabric of your father's life, his every heartbeat. Uh, what was it, you know, she was the yin and the yang uh, on this trip. It was so beautiful to capture that. Uh, tell us about Margot, her, what you think, um, what, was, what was her uh, influence on the, um, the film and how uh, Henry digested everything that happened? She was a strong woman. Um, go ahead, Greg. Could you tell us what you think about your Aunt Margot? I think she was a very strong woman. And you could see that um, she had a hard time saying no to him also. Um, they were very different. She was not as uh, happy and joking and things. She was a little bit uh, darker. And things with Margot were uh, black and white. It was either good or it's bad. And uh, I think you heard that in uh, the film also. So um, it, it, was had, it was difficult to have conversations with her because it, 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 there, was no, there was no leeway in what you were talking about. So um, it, I, I like the way you called it a yin and a yang because I think that's true. Gary? Uh, because she remembered everything and my dad really didn't remember much at all until he actually got to the camp. Um, I don't know how far we would have gone if he hadn't talked her into coming to Krakow with us. Wow. 
she, she was able to point to the exact street. She knew the exact window where they used to look out of. They knew, she knew, I mean, it was incredible to watch her uh, just have everything right there. And I, and there was one line in the film where, where my dad says, it's so important that you came. We're one, we're not, we're, we're not separate people. We're one person. And it wouldn't have been right if, if he would have gone without her. And I think she realized that when she finally decided to go, he had to talk her into it. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't go to Auschwitz, but she did go to Krakow. And so I think she was the, if, if there wasn't a therapist there, she was prop, she and Kitty were probably the closest thing. Okay, okay. Lisa, I'd like you to comment on Margot. And then I'd also like to give voice to Kitty and Kitty's role um, in the in this film in uh, Henry's life, and uh, was she? There's a question: Was she in the same camp, or was she in camps, or was she in different camps? Do we know anything about Kitty? Um, well, I, I think I'd go back with Margot for a minute. Um, you know, mm -hmm. once they you know finally were reunited, um, Mar they were inseparable. Um, they were. Thick as thieves, they they would stay in the same cities. They, you know, she had a gift store in in all of the hotels that he was managing, and um, so in some ways they were business partners. There was, you know, this personal connection. There was this, you know, all the holiday meals. Um, you know, my dad, they would eat together for Passover and. You know, it was just so important. So she was a huge role in my dad's life. And, you know, I think um, they did see the world very differently. Um, she and would really kind of stay within her sort of old country, you know, uh, world where she was with other Holocaust survivors or people from Europe. And, and so she lived kind of that way. My dad really wanted to move past it. And he didn't want that. Um, anymore. He wanted to make new friends and, you know, have a different life. So, um, and then as far as Kitty, you know, Kitty, he and Kitty were very close. They were, they were second cousins and loved each other dearly. Um, I don't, I can't really tell you exactly where Kitty was. I know she wasn't in the same camps as Margo and my dad, um, but she was in uh, slave labor camps. And, um, and really, what I can say is, you know, the, the rest of our, our family, um, except for one aunt, which was Fanny's sister, Aunt Zelma, she survived. But the rest of our, our family um, was murdered. I mean, we have no other family, um, really. And our extended family was gone. So we had so, you know, touching on family. Um, I think, Lisa, what you said, uh, I feel in my heart that there are a lot of second gen who can identify with those mm -hmm. types of voids. So, um, no, you know, you're certainly not alone. Um, what was the question, um, this from uh, one of our attendees, what was the question you did not get to ask your father? If there could have been something you could have asked him about the film or life in general, what, what would that question have been? And, and I, I realize this is impromptu. Uh, so um, if you wanna think about it, we can get back to it. Um, I don't know. Um, Gary, do you have anything you'd like to? Um, he accomplished so much. Is there anything I would maybe ask? Is there anything he regretted not accomplishing? Ah, okay. Greg, I have to think about it. I think. Okay, so Thanks. we'll put a pin in that one. Uh, we could. Uh, we're almost at uh, half an hour in right now, and I can tell you that the the questions are are flying in. So I'll try to get as many of those in as possible, and also uh, carry on with. Uh, um, our, our panel discussions. Uh, I want to go ahead and um, bring up um, another question was, um, if you had to describe your father, who would you say your father was? Who's Henry Lamworth? Uh, I would, oh, go ahead, Gary. 
Um, uh, I, I would describe him as this charismatic, charming, funny, fill up a room kind of guy that everybody wanted to be around. And then behind that was this driving passion that was hard and uh, exacting and impatient and uh, never ending. Okay, Greg? I think he's a, a bit of a, a miracle man. Uh, the things that have happened in his life and the stories and uh, he's always been uh, in the right place except for getting caught for the Holocaust. But after that, uh, he's always been around the right people. And um, I, like Gary said, I believe that they're drawn to him. He had a story and he had the charisma um, but his life was full of miracles and he truly believed in miracles. And um, I believe that, that he was a miracle and that we're here talking, I think is, is one as well. Lisa, would you like to add anything? Yeah. I think before I tell you what I, I think my dad is, I'd like to tell you that my dad, even though he was victimized um, by the Nazis and um, in the most cruel and vicious way. Um, he was never a victim. Um, and I really admired that. I, I, I honored that in him. And, um, you know, the, he, was, he was fearless. You know, he was spontaneous. He was driven. Um, he was also a practical joker. Uh, you know, you could probably see that in some of the movie, but there are so many stories. Um, but I also think he used his humor as a defense mechanism too. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, I'd also say he was also a workaholic. Um, okay. he was driven to succeed. Um, and, um, you know, I think that kind of at all costs. And I think that, you know, our, our, our early family life, you know, suffered because he, he really, you know, it was difficult for him to be there for dinners. And, you know, I think that um, his priority at the beginning was really to succeed and to make something of his life and, you know, a failed marriage and, um, so it was, it was hard, it was difficult. I appreciate your honesty. Um, I just want you to know that the Q and A's continue to pour in and, and the chats are just so filled with, with love and kindness, uh, which makes me feel like your father's kind of with us in the chat and in the Q and A here today too. <laughs> and um, um, Linda Lanworth has let us know that Kitty was in camps for two years in Belgium, so she was not in any of the camps with Henry or Margot. And I appreciate that, Linda, being a journalist by training. I, I like to know the I like to know the facts. Uh, your dad definitely seemed like he. Um, well, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth. Forgiveness. Did that work for your father? Was he able? Um, Contrast that with Margot. What did you just, let's talk about forgiveness in your father. It was a word that he used a lot um, after he started talking about the Holocaust and he felt he was able to forgive them. I think he did in some respects. I think there was always this trepidation even uh, we gone, my brother and I went with him on a trip to Europe when we were 15, 16, 17, something like that. And he didn't want to get off the train in Germany. He would get off anywhere else but Germany. Yeah. And he saw that the train was going to stop in a little town outside of Matthausen. And so he said, let's go. So we grabbed us, we jumped off the train and I think it was in Germany. And that was you said let's time. go or he said let's go? No, I never would have said let, let's go. He said let's go. I want to show you this. Okay. And, um, so that was the only time I know of that he was in Germany 
uh, because he wanted to be, and he didn't really want to be. So I think he forgave. I think he tried to forgive, and he tried to forgive everybody else. Uh, Margo in the movie said no. It, it, it's yeah, a show, I and I don't know. Greg or Lisa, you might have a better sense. You know, it's it, it, as I've been speaking to different school groups and community groups via Zoom right now. I, one of the questions that uh, eighth grader asked was, you know, how did he forgive, you know, what had happened? And I think part of my answer is I'm not so sure um, that it's even forgivable. And I, and that's just me, but I, I just don't, I don't really understand it. I, I think parts of him did forgive in some ways, I guess, but there are other things that he would do and say, and, you know, not drive a certain car. Um, you know, there was a little piece of him that I think that would never ever forget. Uh, but I personally don't know if it's forgivable. Okay. Okay. Um, I have to uh, uh, transition back to something, Gary, you were saying about you and your mother, you and your brother um, deciding uh, with your father to hop off a train in, in a town near Mauthausen uh, and, and then do what? And uh, he, he, he said, I want you to see one of the places I was imprisoned. And did you, did you know that there was this, there was a place where he was in prison that was near this little town that was near Mount Hazen? Uh, we didn't know until he said it. Um, it um, was, how old were you? I, was, I think I was 17, Greg was 15. And so he, um, th this was the first time that he really even opened up at all. And he didn't open up that much, but what he did do, which uh, I'll never forget was he got off the train. We took a taxi to the camp, to Matthausen. I don't know, it was 20 minutes away or so. And we went in and he showed us around. And we were the only people there. It was overcast and dreary. And he walked around and said, this is where the razor wires were that they made us stand for 24 hours. And my friend Maurice stood right next to me and we would talk to each other so we wouldn't fall asleep. Here's where they did this. Here's where they did that. And that was the only time that Greg and I, Lisa wasn't on that trip, but that was the only time that we heard him talk about it directly to us. Um, and then a horrible thing happened. He, we were right getting ready to leave. We were the only people there. And apparently the, the ticket taker slash security guard had gone to lunch. So, so we couldn't get out. And I don't think I've ever seen my dad close to panic as he was there. Wow. Wow. So, so what happened? Um, we, the guard came back after lunch, let us out. We got back on the train and um, we went on our way for the rest of the trip. He didn't talk much about it after that. Greg, do you remember him talking about it? No, but um, you know, years later, just that had happened that they had locked the gates while we were in there. And I remember him feeling so bad that uh, saying that he got his kids locked in to the concentration camp and he felt responsible. Uh, but I remember the look in his face that the gates were locked and that, that we were in there with him. So it was quite a, a bit of irony. Uh, That's been pure terror. That is more cruel than anything out of, uh, that's like a nightmare. Yeah. Oh, I, wow. Wow. And, um, and for him to go back, I, uh, I, to go on the trip was pretty amazing because that short time that we were in Madhausen uh, really, like Gary said, brought back a lot of memories to him. And uh, it's, it's a testament that he was willing to turn around and go back to the other camps 
and knowing how he felt when he was there uh, with mm -hmm. us. So, mm -hmm. was I think it was so important for him to 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 have this film finished and actually be able to share it with us and also uh, with the next generation and to keep telling the story. And I think that that was really what drove him um, to do this, you know, to finish it and to be a part of the, the film. It was so important. Well, this leads uh, directly to my next question and ask you, um, what was it like to grow up as the, ch the child of uh, a Holocaust survivor? Uh, yeah. Well, it was, I, we, when we were growing up, I don't think we thought of ourselves as that. I don't right. think we realized, I didn't realize, I was trying to think last night, probably until mm -hmm. third grade, fourth grade that he was. Um, and then as we got older, we started reading stories about him in the newspaper. That's how we would find out any of the, the, the details. So you um, found out through the newspaper? Yeah, yeah, for the most part, because he wouldn't tell us. I'm sure he was protecting us. And mm -hmm. so we eventually knew that he was a Holocaust survivor. Um, but I think in the early days, what, what overshadowed that was just his amazing life. I mean, growing up as a, a son or daughter of Henry Landworth was exciting. We had astronauts in the house for dinner. We, we um, got to go to, to the launches. We were around famous people that he loved being around and loved being around him. And so that was an exciting time. And as we grew, that's, that's, that the Holocaust story was always in the background and everybody knew it, especially all of his friends. I think as he got more comfortable, it got more, put more and more into the foreground. And that's when we, at least me, started realizing I was a son of a Holocaust survivor and that was part of my identity. And, and probably wasn't until I was in my early teens that that happened. How about you, Lisa? Um, I wanna know what it was like. And then I want to know when you realize, I mean, did you see it in the paper too? Like did Gary come over to you and Greg and go, oh my gosh, this is, look what happened to dad. Like, I need a visual. No, really for me, and it may have been because I was the youngest, um, my mom really told me um, a lot of what went on with my dad. He had shared, I'm sure, quite a bit with her, and she shared a lot of it with me before my dad wrote the book and talked about his experiences in the book, and then I knew even more details, and that was not until I was 22 that I read the book, and I had just tears rolling down my cheeks reading the details of um you know his experiences in the holocaust and the concentration camps and what really went on but you know it was really my mom you know she was really the rock she was the real gem um that that just um kind of held it all together um you know when my dad wasn't there and and the other piece of it is that i felt like I felt in some way a responsibility, I guess is the word, mm -hmm. in, in some ways not to, growing up with him, not to burden him in any way or bring pain or sorrow, more of it. Um, so, you know, it was kind of a responsibility that I felt. And I, I we all, I, I think we all would agree that we sort of had to walk this line of, you know, well, don't upset Pop. We just don't want to, you know, uh, him to, to feel any more um, sorrow. Mm. Greg, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, it, I, don't, I don't think I identified as a Holocaust uh, survivor's son. Um, there weren't any there, except for our cousins, Margot's kids, um, I didn't know anyone else that had a family that was involved with the Holocaust. Uh, the temple that we went to, they didn't make us feel any different or special or uh, it was kind of, it seemed like it was kind of kept quiet a little bit just because uh, we didn't really know too much about what to talk about. I know I don't re ever remember talking with my cousins 
about uh, their mother's experience, Margot's experience, and Pop's experience. I don't think we ever had conversations like that uh, to, to identify ourselves as being a little bit different. Um, so it, it, it was kind of difficult. I don't think anyone could really understand, Gary and Lisa and I, we have all this, uh, I don't want to say it's baggage, but it's, we have all of the, the same experiences uh, growing up. And that really kind of solidified who we were, I think, as siblings also. So. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, did, um, did, what, did your, um, I, I think this naturally leads to um, a question about um, your, uh, um, your faith, your identity, like did your father have um, a religious, was there a religious element in his life? After all, this was clearly um, a horrific thing that happened to humanity, it's humanity's Jewish population. Uh, and did that role or religion uh, come into your lives at all? Um, your schooling, anything like that? Uh, he definitely, we, we definitely went to synagogue, not all the time, but occasionally. Greg and I both got bar mitzvah. And so it was important for him to, to be Jewish, I think. Uh, I remember, I do remember um, we couldn't join the, the, uh, the country club. The yacht, we, club. Mm -hmm. the yacht Club. Yacht Club, yeah. The Yacht Club where? It was in Lakeland, Florida. And mm. that always stuck with me. And he just sort of said, no, I can't, we can't join. I'm Jewish, we can't join. It was more matter of fact than it was anything else. Um, my mom was Catholic when they got married. She converted to, um, to Judaism. And so the picture you, you see now was with us in the Christmas tree. We, She's beautiful. We, yes, she was. So we had the Jewish uh, cultural holidays. We had the Christian cultural holidays. So I was kind of joked we ended up somewhere in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I doubled it too. I loved it. <laughs> Um, Lisa, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, I, you know, I feel like my dad um, was a very spiritual person. He was actually uh, bar mitzvahed um, in the Krakow ghetto. And um, I can't even imagine what that must have been like and how harrowing that must have been. Um, so he was 13 when he was there. Um, he always kept really believed God spared him, you know, for a reason. And he really was faithful to God. And I, um, I think he felt that way, you know, at, ever since he survived, you know, the, the Holocaust. And it was important to keep the traditions of the Jewish holiday. My mom was great about that, you know, Passover and, you know, Yom Kippur and all of the holidays she would she would really, um, you know, prepare the foods and she would even invite him, you know, after they were divorced. Aww. Mm -hmm. Aww. So do you feel you have a responsibility to share your father's story? We're, we're almost at the top of the hour. It's hard to believe. Uh, do you feel you have a responsibility to share your father's story? And what, what do you want your father's legacy to be and the takeaway to be um, regarding when people see the film or learn about your father's story when they hear from you, Lisa, in the classroom or in future curriculum, et cetera. Um, I definitely feel a need to, to share a story, responsibility to share a story, especially as you mentioned at the top with what's going on today. Um, and now that there are so few survivors left, I think it's probably our job as a second gen to, to try and keep those stories alive. I mentioned earlier about how important the stories were, not just the facts and figures. And for us to have uh, a father that was as visible as he was, as successful, kind of as in some ways famous in a small circle, um, 
gives him a visibility that other people might not have. Uh, all of the stories that are in the Holocaust Museum in Washington are certainly just as powerful, just as horrific. Um, and I think it's important to tell all of them. We are lucky that we happen to have this movie to go with it. We, we don't have to just say, here's what we heard our father go through. Mm -hmm. We can say, watch this. Listen to what he said as he was there. Look at how it affected him as he was trying to walk through Auschwitz and couldn't do it. Um, I, I, I feel that even more as I get older, as, as the survivors get fewer and fewer. I, I, everybody I meet, I think at this point, very shortly after I meet them, they know that, I'm, that my dad is a Holocaust survivor. Wow, wow. Greg. Um, I'm hoping uh, with the generation, even, even the World War II veterans that are dying, they were there to witness what had happened. And with the Holocaust survivors, uh, numbers dwindling, I think it's really important to keep his story and the, the remembrance of the Holocaust alive. Uh, with today's environment, with media, social media, uh, hate groups and things, there's, without people around to, uh, to validate what actually happened, um, I, I'm afraid that they're gonna want to rewrite history uh, and try to kind of take it out of the books. I know that there's a lot of students, high school students and college students, they, they don't know anything about the Holocaust. And um, then for some adults to, to believe that it never, never happened. Uh, I had a friend for 30 years. He had been with my father. He had seen my father's tattoo. And in recent years, he doesn't believe the Holocaust actually happened. So we're not actually friends anymore. But um, it, it has to the truth has to, to be told. And I think that's really, really, really important. Well, Greg, I think that's an incredibly powerful um, uh, place where we can um, wrap it for, um, perhaps this will be the first of many conversations uh, we can have uh, about uh, your father's remarkable life and legacy. And you know, Deborah Lipstadt said it best, there are facts, there are opinions and there are lies. And what you are doing by uh, uh, you know, having this conversation with us today, uh, what Robert is doing by bringing this beautiful film to the world is that we are there as the facts. Uh, we all can do something. And I think you all three stand as testimony to the bravery it takes to tell the story, to tell your father's story, to explore who you are and the effects of the Holocaust on the second gen. And hopefully this will inspire other people. I mean, I know you inspire me, so I'm sure this will inspire other people to capture their own parents' story, uh, whether the written word, film, music, art, uh, however they choose to do it. Uh, and I feel hopeful about that uh, because of people like you and your father, so you're welcome. I wanna thank you um, so much. Lisa, did you wanna say something else? I just had one other thing to say, um, yes. that I feel a, a huge moral obligation um, for us to keep talking about this and sharing um, the story to others. And, um, and especially with the rising tide of the intolerance in the last you know, four years and anti-Semitism and racism and all of the hate crimes that have been going on that it's imperative now more than any other time that, um, you know, we can talk about it, but I think you also have to, to do something about it. And I think my dad's, my dad sort of invented the whole Nike, you know, just do it before it ever even, you know, evolved to anything was you know, you have to really be a part of the solution. And I, and I hope that, um, I hope that we can all step into that role. Well, you've charged everyone here. You've given them a beautiful gift. 
They've had the opportunity to see the film and they have inherited your father's story now, just like you have. And it's up to them to tell that story and the millions of stories like it to be a light in the world. So I wanna thank you again. Thank you. Okay, well, I, I do wish we had more time. Um, I want to thank, thank you all so much. And I want to uh, turn uh, the discussion now over uh, back to Barbara Goldstein of the Holocaust Education and Resource Council. Thank you. I want to thank everybody. And thank you, Lisa, Gary, and Greg. This was absolutely wonderful. And thank you, Stacy, for the, for the great discussion and questions. Every year during Yom HaShoah, people gather to watch lighting of six candles, representing the six million Jews who were murdered in the Holocaust. On behalf of the Holocaust Education Resource Council and Searching for Identity, I would like to pause and imagine we are together, as hopefully next year we will be, and lighting the six memorial candles. You will see the six candles now. Well, the number one candle is to remember the babies and children. The second candle is to remember the mothers and fathers. The third candle is to remember the grandparents. The fourth candle is to remember the families. The fifth candle is to remember the friends. And the sixth candle is to remember the liberators. This program today is dedicated in memory of all the Holocaust victims. And we should never forget.